Morning, good afternoon now. Thank you everybody for coming. I know that you got your time is really valuable and I go to a lot of these things. I'm probably gonna walk a bit during the presentation. I always feel like I'm hiding behind the podium even in trial, but <laughs> thank you for coming. I know that you have, it's, your time is valuable, but I think this is a really important subject matter and it really does affect everybody. So even if you're an employee or you're working with someone, if you're working in HR or if you're an executive, I really think that all these laws, because they're changing so fast, are important to everyone. And as you probably know, to start with, a lot of these changes between last week and now have signed, signed and become into law. If you're welcome to take a look at your booklet, I'm going to follow along with it, and you're welcome to take a look at it if you'd like to, but if you'd rather just listen, that will work too. In your booklets, there's more material than we can cover today, so for example, on the wage and hour issues, I included some statutes on the paid leave and things like that. That's also, there are some articles I think that would be interesting to you. There are also summaries about the law and how that is changing. So for example, last week, some of you probably heard about the Uber legislation or the gig economy legislation, which is how it affects independent contractors. Governor Newsom just signed it on September 18th. That's supposed to go into effect January 1st of next year. We don't really know how he's, that's going to go into effect yet. I'm expecting there's going to be some litigation. So if you look at the little asterisks and all these, these laws are changing fast. And part of it is just how the world is right now. And part of it is we have a governor now who ran on an employment law platform. So a lot of these things, that was his big push and he seems to be doing that. For example, you'll see another one for uh, paid disability leave, that's going to be extended out from six to eight weeks. We don't know what the benefits are going to be. This will be summarized for you, but bear in mind, a lot of these change. Uh, what my presentation is about today is the changes, the summaries of each area of the law, sort of an overview. They're also in your booklets. If you would like a digital copy, you're welcome to it. We can, I can send it to you or Judy can send it to you. And sort of the direction is set up, but more importantly, what employers can do employees can know about their rights and employers can do to make sure that their records are in compliance. We're having getting a lot of calls from employers who may have followed the law, but their records don't show that. So you have these issues, for example, sexual harassment training, which we'll cover. A lot of employers aren't doing this. I've had getting a lot of calls from them. You, some of you may already know that at the beginning of the year, they are supposed to be in compliance with any employee, any business with five employees or more that includes independent contractors, seasonal workers, for example, people work at Target, all have to be trained in this area. If they're not and they get sued, they're considered not in compliance. They can be fined, they can be sued for this. Governor Newsom did extend that out to 2021, which is good news for some employers. But I think a lot of people don't even know about the changes in the law because they're happening so fast. So I think it's important that you have some idea of what you need to do. The other change in the law, which I'm going to start with, which is preventing wage and hour claims. If you'd like to look in your booklet, you're welcome to do that. And if you go to the third, to the third page, there's sort of potential penalties for late and other wage payment violations. If you take a look at it there, and it's... It sort of summarizes what can happen if you do not follow the wage, waiting time penalties. So, so fa say, for example, you don't pay your employee on time. You are going to get a waiting time penalty. So say, for example, hey, I'm sorry, I could, you know, if it's a small office or there's a delay in payroll, that's not going to be your employee's problem. It's going to become your problem. So say, for example, you pay them next week and they say, okay, yeah, sure. The employee later, if they want to file a claim, unfortunately, I am getting a lot of these calls from employers saying there was a mistake on it. They didn't receive their check on time. However you do that, there are waiting penalties for that. So that you, what you need to do is make sure you're current. If you have an HR person or a payroll person, you need to have these in place. There also is the law that a lot of people aren't aware of. It is a misdemeanor not to have in your payroll when you're going to pay a person and a posting in your office or in your break room or wherever it's going to be. It's those little posters. You may have seen them. The state provides them. Cal Chamber is another good service that has these. I mean, they, they do cost something, but at least they're current and they're updating you. For example, the law changed in March and April of this year saying you have to do it. The chances of you getting prosecuted are very unlikely for something like this, but where it comes into play, for example, is if you fail to do it. And then you get an email, you get a letter from a plaintiff's attorney. That's what some of these people do all day, not me. But you know, the, there are these businesses, if you've ever received a letter from these people, and I have several clients who have 
all they do all day long is they have their associates there churning out letters, meeting with these people and saying, you're in, you're, you failed to comply with these things. You failed to do this. That'll be another one on your list and it can result in fines. Realistically, is that going to happen to everyone who violates it? No, because the state just doesn't have the resources to prosecute these people and there are other more pressing matters. But it can be used as evidence later. So you need to be aware of this. You are much better off having a break room with all these posters in it and making sure that you're up to date on it. it I know it sounds like a little thing, but it's going to keep you in compliance. And that's what you need to be doing here. So if you ever get sued, the AG comes calling, you can say, look, we have all these. They're posted here. Whether or not they're in a clear place, these people knew their rights. And so you can do that. Has, the Can other one, Cal Chamber? <clears throat> Cal Chamber is one service. It's a paid for service, but you can also have the uh, DFEH, but by the time they get them to you, the law could change again. They have several services where they're free. Either the posters may not, they're like six to 12 bucks, I would say a piece, but they send out alerts where there's, you know, notice there's a change in the law and this new poster has come out. So if you want to be in compliance, you need to do it by this date. Fortunately, they usually give you about 30 to 90 days notice for some of these, but what happens is if you fall behind in this area, it can happen, then you've got a problem. It's like, well, this isn't really the law and what are you telling them? And again, I deal, I do a lot of defense work. I also do a lot of work for, you've pro I've probably all heard of the Me Too movement. I'm one of their legal defense fund attorneys. So we do, do, I do plaintiff's work in that regard. What's going to happen is you're going to get a letter from some nasty lawyer saying, well, you failed to do this, you failed to do this, and you know, this is how they earn their living. So if they don't, they want to get money, they want to get paid for this. So they're going to push any issue and it, it can make your life miserable. So to avoid this, you need to be saying, look, we have posters here, we're clear about this. If you have an HR person, it is really a good idea that they go to some sort of training or that you have summaries and checklists. We'll cover this again. But to even just to make a list of so each new employee, some of them have employee checklists and what you're posting here and are they current. It's a lot of material to cover, but if you have it concisely written, it, it can be done and it's not going to take up hours, weeks of your time because anybody has a small, medium, large size business is like, I'm not real excited about paying this person for three weeks out of the next month to be in compliance with everyone. It won't take that long if you're organized. If you're not organized, you're going to have a mishmash of things sending them over to people and say, oh, I think we told this person, I don't really remember. You need to keep clear records of these things, for example. But look at these. Has anybody heard of the, uh, the, the APAGA claim? Is anybody, not, I know we were discussing it. Is anybody not familiar with what this is? This is the Private Attorneys General's Act, which a lot of plaintiff's lawyers are using. So say, for example, the classic example is a janitorial staff that you have or a maid service and they come in and clean and you've classified them all, misclassified them all as independent contractors. They get one person, this one aggrieved person can sue on behalf of the party. They will file a complaint with the Attorney General's office online. You have 30 to 45 days to cure it. For example, they say, you failed to pay me minimum wage. You misclassified me, you didn't pay me for these, or you have wage statement violations. If you do not cure it within that period of time, they have the right to sue. Usually what happens is similar to what the labor, the labor board is now doing. They used to be, you had to get a right to sue letter. Filing a complaint with the labor board now triggers that because they have so many claims. I have several clients who are in front, if everybody's not heard of a labor board claim, often what they'll do is say, I don't want to hire an attorney, I'll have the labor board take care of it. The labor board really doesn't have a lot of authority and what they are is really backed up. I've talked to some of the just settlement conference judges there. They are pulling people out of retirement because they have so many claims coming in. The difference between a PAGA claim and some of these others is, you, may, for example, wage statement violation, you look at page one, it's $50 for the first violation, $100 for the second. That means if you fail to pay them, for example, minimum wage, their, their wage statement is going to be wrong because you're writing it down wrong. And each subsequent violation, and it's up to $4,000. It's a sum of money. No one wants to pay that. But what's going to happen with the Private Attorney General's Act claim or a PAGA claim is they're allowed to recover attorney's fees. And that's always a defense to a plaintiff's claim. So say, for example, I know as a, when I often do defense work, if, it's, if they're taking on what's called contingency, that attorney is not getting paid. No attorney's in the business of not getting paid. Nobody's in the business of not getting paid unless they're nonprofit. That used to be a defense. This will allow people to recover legal fees. 
And for that reason alone, people often do that. I get a lot of clients calling and say, oh my God, he's got a PAGA claim and what's that going to mean to me? It means he's suing on the behalf of an aggrieved class. It's sort of like a mini class action suit for anybody who's ever worked for that person. You know, I have, Sorry. oh, that's all right, welcome. There's a booklet if you'd like one, uh, right, uh, it's right there. And so if what's going to happen, I've had a lot of these people do it, bear in mind, you cannot waive a PAGA claim. So I have had certain situations where an employee will come to me. I've had lawyers who practice employment law say, hey, I need a release so you can release all claims. Those are falling into disfavor. So example, a PAGA claim is considered a government claim. You cannot waive a PAGA claim. So anybody who tells you that is, is flat out wrong. That's not the case. If you try to do it, you could be accused of coercing your employees. So the only person who can sign off on that is an authorized government employee from the AG's office. So once you've got that, with that being said, it doesn't mean you can't settle it, but you do need to contact them. And again, part of this is to make sure that you're aware of these. If you look at, I've also included uh, some the penalties for each failure to miss, you know, miss a wage, an hour claim, miss a break. I have a lot of people who are calling me about these. If you look at page five or six, rest or meal breaks. And again, these are just summaries so you're aware of what you need to do. Okay, anybody who is a non-exempt employee who works more than three and a half hours a day, you need a 10 minute rest break, rest break for every four hours worked. I have a lot of these restaurants, hotels, I represent a lot of these where the person, I, and I've actually witnessed it firsthand when I'm visiting a client, the person will say, oh, that, oh I don't really need to take my break. If the person is doing that, you need to have them sign a waiver. I know it sounds bad. You need to have a system in place where you are following up with everybody because what's going to happen is something doesn't work out or maybe they fall in hard times. I've had this where a really nice people have gotten into drugs, alcohol, bad marriages, bankruptcies, financial problems, and mental illness or maybe they're just being coerced by someone. If they file a claim against you and you don't have evidence of the breaks, you need to do that. Some people use the time card system. Other people have a regular reminder that they need to do this. That does not mean when you're busy during the day, and, and like, for example, when I'm in court, I, I don't have time to sit there and say to my assistant, did you take your break? You need to do that, but you need to have a reminder system in place. If they're waiving their breaks, there's a, there's a standard form, you can have them sign saying I've done this, I'm willing to take my break. The t breaks are paid, lunch is another issue, half hour. Those, are, those can be unpaid, some employers pay it anyway. But you need to allow them to do this. And if they're saying, oh, don't worry, I had seen supervisors go, oh, don't worry about it, you need, you need to take your break. And that's all that has to have happen and they keep doing that and say, well, every time I needed a break, and then the employer's looking and going, I've been sued and this person worked here for three years. I have no idea on any given day when they took their break. I told them to or I didn't tell them to. They said they were doing it. And again, it doesn't mean you have to follow your employees around. They're expected to be adults and responsible, but you need to have some accountability procedure in place because if the only other witness is the employer or someone who's a good friend of that person, they're gonna say, well, of course you're gonna say that and you'd say anything right now to protect yourself and make sure you don't get sued. You need, you need to do this though. And again, uh, the- you don't have time cards. Uh, how could you prove that somebody took their break without the time cards? I mean you can, you can see them take their break every day, or they could say, "I'm going on break." Right. So you, that's your own recollection. Yeah, I usually I usually have them do is like a sign-in sheet, what time they took in. You know, they just have it at their desk, or they just fill it in. That's part of the employee's responsibility. Say, "This is the time I took my break. This is the time I came back." And it's not to treat them like children, but on the other hand, you sort of have to do that. If you have someone who's very reliable, I mean, it, it's nice, but. I do have some employers say, look, you're going to get a daily reminder to take your break, you know, every three and a half hours. That's another one. They have, again, they have the posters, put those up. That's going to be some evidence. And again, if the person's not taking a break, I'm not saying you have to go to this person every day. Did you take your break? Did you take your break? I know, I mean, it would be annoying. It'd probably be annoying for you of all the things, if you're business owners, that you have to do on a daily basis. But you need to have a system in place. If the person is saying, oh, I didn't take my break and I told you I did, then the, that's on the employee, as I see it. And there are valid defenses to that, but you need to have some system in place. But again, if they're working at a computer and you have one of those, if you have a regular text that goes, reminder, take your break, reminder, do you have a right to a meal break? You need to do that because what they're gonna say is, the, the typical thing I hear from an aggrieved employee is, 
well, they said I could take my break, but they really don't want me to. And, you know, they sort of discourage that kind of behavior or I wanted to take my lunch and they wouldn't let me. And so they're not giving me the space to do that. You need to do that. It can be away from their desk. They do not have to sit at their desk to do that. Do they not have to be at their workstation? The exceptions would be if it's a situation like, for example, we represent some trucking companies and employment matters. If they're going to leave a truck that's hauling precious cargo literally unattended, they can't do that. So they have to make allowances for that when they can do that. So there are some exceptions, but they need to have the breaks. This kind of small thing can add up, so I would really advise you to take a look at that. It's a, there are some exemptions, for example, you know, lawyers, doctors, often accountants, but they're considered white. They're considered non-exempt. Anybody else has to do this. If you don't follow along with this, the, the problem is you have some employees unhappy later or is hard up for money, and then just says finds a plaintiff's attorney or such and says, oh yeah, I know I didn't really like that. There is the perception by a lot of employees, and I've often been one. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to be an employee that their own, the owners are rich people who can afford to pay out any amount of money and every penny that comes in is going to the owner. And that's not always true. So, yes? Or, or revenge. Yeah, revenge. Which yeah. is very big. Uh, it's really, what you're talking about really is, is litigation containment. Right. And even though you may think it's, it's, it's a minor thing that's a pain in the rear end, it's bigger pain if someone goes after you. That's, that's exactly true. And I get a lot of calls from very upset employers saying, I tried to be a good employer. I didn't supervise them. I wasn't harping on them. I wasn't micromanaging them. I sort of gave them free reign around the place. And then they came back and sued me. I thought this person was family. I thought they liked me. And then that's not the case. And the person, then the employee is going to say, so a lot of this is about this lunch and learn, is to see what you can do to prevent that and prevent this from happening. Because the more you can do to prevent it, and again, it, it, it's, I'll, I'll be candid, it's going to take several hours of your time to make sure these are all in your place, in place. But if you do that, you have a much better chance of, one, defeating any claim. I have had several clients successfully do this where they, they get the, you know, the god-awful letter from the plaintiff's attorney saying, my attorneys, my client's been you know, horribly treated, and this is all these things. And again, I'm not saying there are a lot of people who legitimately have claims. But my problem with people who file false claims and do this is one, they're not true, one, they cause a lot of stress and unnecessary money is expended for the employer. And three, there really are people who deserve to have access to the court system. This just delays and backs everything up for people who really have legitimate claims and should have rights to do that, regardless of their income level or what the situation is. But I, yes. Um. The, I notice that there's a lot, uh, many employees that um, actually seem to be taking a lot of breaks with their cell phone and texting um, friends, family, oh, my kid has to be able to uh, text me any time in their right. text. So they're taking multiple breaks, actually. Um, so would that be something you could show? Because actually to have cell phone records to show that during the time they're supposed to be right. working. I, I think that's true. I mean, obviously, if there's an emergency with a child, that's a different situation. But I, I do get that a lot from, oh, such and such was on the phone for 35 minutes. What do you mean he or she didn't take a break or they're texting? No, I mean, it's in fact, it was on the TV that the schools are getting tired of the parents texting. I mean, in my day, we went to school all day. We didn't have to check with mommy and daddy. And um, But I've had, this isn't... Uh, emergency this is just it's like the hey are you what are you doing you yeah, know what are you doing? and but that's not if you're paying attention to that you can't work and I mean as an employee who doesn't do that um it, sometimes it's really annoying when they have to have their cell phone in a meeting I mean really and, and it's for personal so could that you know yeah, that could be counted as a break, depending on the amount of time. But what you can't do, they need to have a 10-minute consecutive break. I usually tell employers, give them 15 minutes, so that way they're not saying you're being shorted. But what I do tend to tell them is you should have to either you can do it privately if you have to, you know, because you – look, I mean – you have to be careful how you say it, because if you say one thing, later they're going to recall that and say, hey, that's not what I meant. You misconstrued. I think that's an excellent question, because I think a lot of people do it. And I've been in that situation myself, where you're like, look, I'm working all day, and you're on the phone. Great. You know, hey. <laughs> it's a, so don't tell me you've been you know, harmed here. But I think what you need to do as an employer is, one, say, 
to, you know, if you want to use your cell phone, you need to keep in touch with your kids, that's fine. But this is not chat hour. You're here to work. So, you know, if you want to socialize, do it on your lunch hour or do it on your break. And that, that's what a responsible employer should, employee should do. And so if they're not doing that, I mean, I think you have to have a company policy. There's also the reasonable expectation of privacy. I think you need to be, I'll get to that point in the employee handbook and things like that. Some employees aren't clear, for example, whose cell phone is it if the employer is paying for it. You know, anything you send out, you need to tell them. Emails, things like that. Or a lot of people have those chats on their computer. So they're on their computer all day, but, you know, they're getting pop-ups all day like, hey, what are you doing? Or, hey, what are you doing later? That, that's not at all pertinent to it. And I'm, I'm saying, what I'm not saying that employees can just do whatever they want, and they shouldn't. I mean, it's, it's, you're, you're here to work, and not everybody likes being at work all day. I mean, I'm sure, yes? Can't you make a ruling that you cannot use your cell phone, period, while you're working? I, I wouldn't advise that, because particularly if they have children and there's an emergency, because what they're going to say is you're preventing it. So what I usually have a rule in your handbook is to say, look, you're welcome. We're, you know, depending on the policy there, say, look, you're welcome to use your cell phone if it really is an emergency. You're just texting a, a second, you know, I'll meet you later. I can't really talk right now. But if they're having chats and conversations, you need to bring that employee and say, look, this is not what this is for and you're not really working during work hours. You need to document their file and say, this is what's been going on. Because what a lot of these people will do, I found it a lot, they'll do it on those, they'll say, well, I'm not really getting my break. It's like, well, you know, you spent two and a half hours texting today. What do you mean you didn't get your break? And you worked eight hours. So you had an eight hour day, two and a half hours on the phone, and then you took your lunch break. So you worked five hours for me today and I paid you for eight. So it's, you have those issues coming up. So there's, there's always gonna be some people, unfortunately, take advantage. But what again, again, I had a suit downtown where we just had where the employee was drinking on the job and posting things and doing a lot of things, and she was pretty much left unsupervised and claimed later she was never paid. She didn't win. But it's, it's good to have the documentation. If you have an employee who's doing this, you have to politely say, make a record of it. And it, it, you know, I'm a little more lax in my office. I, I don't like to be the one who's going around saying, hey, look, you're not doing this. And you know, I, I don't like to do that. But I think in chance situations are, you're much better off just recording and say, look, however you want to do this on your time. I think an employee handbook, you need to make clear about what is reasonably private and what isn't. And you need to have a policy in effect to say, look, we're not saying you can't have, you're going to be cut off from the outside world for the eight to 10 hours a day you're here. But on the other hand, let, let's keep it to a minimum. This is work time. Other people are doing this. And if you don't do your work, I mean, it is the standard. California is still an at-will employment state. If it becomes a problem where the person is you know, unless they're paying a key role, people should not abuse the right with their employers. I mean, I always, I think most people appreciate if they're working for someone who's like, look, I, I'm not going to ask you to be at your desk every second. I'm not going to be hanging over your, hanging over you, but I need to know what you're doing. And so situations like, it's, it's a hard one too. And of course, the bottom line is, do you really, if that's your call, do you really want to have someone working there who's not being as productive as they could? And so that's, but I think you need to document, but adding up the minutes is not going to count as a break. So you just need to tell them, look, these are your breaks. If you need a little extra time, that's fine. But if you're going to be on the phone for 45 <laughs> minutes, take a lunch break or do it after work or come to me and tell me, but document the file, make sure there's something in their thing saying, you know, it's been six weeks now and this person's doing this every day and doesn't seem to be listening. And then you might want to consider whether that's someone you want to be working with, I would say. Uh, wage and hour laws, note that there is a difference between federal and state, and we're going to touch briefly upon because in the interest of time, federal and state law differ on the overtime laws. So it used to be you had a lot of people would say, okay, I work 10 hour days, four days a week, so I get my 40 in. You're in compliance with federal law, you don't have to pay overtime. In California, you do. It is a 40 hour work week and any more than eight hours a day. So if it's and it is, it is time and a half. If the person has to work seven days, they are going to be paid. If they work more than 12 hours a day, they're going to be paid double time. If they work on the seventh day after eight hours, they're going to be paid double time. So California differs from federal. I get a lot of people asking me because they'll have people coming in from other states, you know, saying, which, which law do I follow? They're a resident of, say, Illinois, but they're over here in California working on a California <coughs> job you're better off erring on the side of the more stringent policy. So the one who's gonna pay them more, and that's the case there. But make sure that you keep track of it. And so if a person says, oh, don't worry about it. I have the classic case where someone says, well, I'll just sign off and I, I just won't say I'm working. 
don't do that. You know, they have a lot of these people, and some of them really are diligent employees because they don't want to pay them overtime. You need to pay them or say, look, I need you to come in an extra day or do what you need to do because it's if you don't do that, you're going to have a problem later on. So what I want to make sure is everybody understands that. And again, there are some gray areas here. I'm going to talk briefly about employment law agreements. There is a there's a arbit a lot of people have seen may have seen that there is an arbitration agreement. Some of them have say if you have any claims to them, you can arbitrate those. There is a bill that is be it's been vetoed twice by Governor Brown, but now the Governor Newsom is in it is up again for review. And the issue is whether you can waive a lot of these employment law claims. So. These arbitration clauses keep coming up. A lot of people have issues with them. So a lot of your employment agreements, if you have them, may be null and void to that. And we'll have to wait and see what Governor Newsom says. Currently, they are valid on limited issues. There are some rights that you cannot waive. But if you're having an employee sign something, so there used to be the standard one, well, you sign something, you can't do that. That doesn't really exist anymore. And if you continue to do that, it, you may run into trouble, and it, the, the problem is these laws are changing fast. So what may happen is, for example, cases up on review with the this Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court, it comes out, it, a lot of people don't hear about it. For example, with AB5 that Governor Newsom just signed, a lot of people may not have known about the Dynamex case, but they're going to know about it now. So I would really encourage you, if you're going to have an employee sign something, Make sure that you're staying up to date on this. The same thing goes for employment law agreements and employee handbooks. If you have a handbook that is out of date, it's going to be Exhibit A in any lawsuit that you get filed, sued with. So if it's out of date or it's not up to date, it could be a problem for you. So it's also going to be considered what's called an implied in fact contract. So example, your company has an employee handbook. There were some new hires, maybe they slipped through the cracks, maybe your HR person was out for a couple of weeks or out on maternity to leave or however that worked. They don't sign it, but some of these other people have signed it. They're going to call it what's an implied in fact contract, meaning everybody else had to do this, we're gonna assume these rules apply to them. But again, you need to be current on that and just to make sure that you are. Uh, paid family law leave. You, you need to be current on your employee handbook. What do you mean current with what the current laws are? Current with what the current laws are. If there is a change to it, for example, and we also have, um, we also recommend a separate waiver signing. We have a sexual harassment policy. We also recommend, which a point why we'll get to that they sign that. So say, for example, you have a change. There's a change in the law, and that's all right. Your employee handbook, your employee handbook says something like. You know, something that's out of date of law, or you know, your sick paid days are these, and then the person changes, the, the law changes in that. What you need to do is probably the best practice is to get a waiver saying, I acknowledge, you know, have something typed up, have your lawyer review it or make sure it's in compliance, have everyone sign it and say there's been a change to your employee handbook and this is it and they've received it. There are some employees, if you're having difficulty, say, well, I didn't, I'm not going to sign that. Send it to them either way, send it to by email and say you're reviewing that and say that it's you're going to your break time. <laughs> <It's not> <laughs> <good>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll Don't worry about it. So make sure that you have those. But what I recommend is you have said so there's been a revision to your handbook. This is the revision to your handbook. Please sign and acknowledge you've done it. If the pro some people are saying, I don't want to sign that. You know, they're having issues with, with their employer for whatever reason. This particularly happens later. Send them an email and say, look, this is the one we'd like you to sign because a lot of people, for example, I've talked to a lot of Uber drivers about how they feel about this new gig economy legislation. Well, I'm saying, yeah, Uber's trying to get us to sign a petition that we've, we're fine with this. We don't want to do that. Some people are not going to sign it. Keep it in their personnel file if they won't sign it, saying that we're given the opportunity to sign it, saying we are hereby notifying you. That way you have, if you send an email to a person and they respond to it, that's considered receipt. So if it goes in, you can't just say, well, it didn't come back. If the person responds to it, even if they don't sign it, it means they've received it, so they understand. California still is an at-will at -will state, so you can make these revisions. But if you don't make the revisions to it, then you have an out-of-date thing, and they say, well, you weren't in compliance here. This is the law three years ago. And what, does, you know, what, else, have, what else are you not up to date on? And again, it, so there are some attorneys. Uh, uh, ones I do business with don't, but there are some attorneys who will just, you know, there's like, oh, well, you didn't do this, and you, they'll make up a problem when there isn't one. And what you don't want is this to become your nightmare when you're having to pay your defense. Yes? Can't you, like, use it as a tool, really, to rat out if somebody doesn't want to sign? It seems yes. to me 
that's a big red flag that. Oh, I think it is. I think it is. But a disgruntled Can you employee. Bring somebody in to the, your office, and then like, how would you, would how would you recommend approaching them? You seem unhappy. Yeah, I, I would. I would approach them. And say, look, we need you know need you to sign. It. I mean, you can't ever force a person to say, look, are there any issues here? Why are you uncomfortable signing it? I mean, the reality is, if they don't sign it, it doesn't mean it doesn't become part of it. But you need to have a talk with them about why they're uncomfortable with it. If there's a legal right and things like that, just remember, sometimes you have to have a neutral there as a witness. So, for example, if it's a male talking to a female, or a female talking to a female, or a female talking to a male, some people feel uncomfortable with that. You know, the reality is there, there are people out there who are going to take, try to take advantage of anything they can. They're like, hey, look, this is free money. You know, I have one client right now who has settled one lawsuit and they got another lawsuit from the same person. She's like, oh, and then the reason it was because he had insurance coverage for one of the claims, even though it wasn't a valid claim. The insurance company said, look, I'd rather, we'd rather just pay it. And, you know, this is the cost of doing business. You're properly insured, not because we believe in it. So you have a settlement agreement that says, you know, without admission of fault, we have this. And the person goes, oh, great, they paid this. Maybe they'll pay this, too. So we got another claim. And this one, we're just like, send a letter. I'm like, this is bogus. We're not responding. We're not going to pay this. You know, you, you file suit if you need to. But it's, you're much better off having all this documentation in place and just saying you're talking. To, and I think it's a, a good point. Usually, if they're refusing to sign that, there are probably other issues there with that employee. I mean, that being said, if they refuse to sign it, you can't fire them. But if there's a performance problem or if there are other issues, but it, it does send up a red flag, I think. I would, I would certainly be on alert to it. Uh, just note that there is a new law that is going to affect and regarding changing subjects to paid family leave and to paid leave. S SB 83, that is just signed by Governor Newsom, that is going to go into effect on November of this year. And it's uh, make paid family leave, it's care for a seriously ill child, spouse, grandparent, sibling, domestic partner, or to bond with a minor child for the first year of birth that is going into adoption or foster care. They have changed this from, and uh, commencing, I think it is in July of next year, they're extending that paid family leave. Now it's six, it's going to eight weeks. Governor Newsom is going to have to elucidate on what he thinks the exact benefits are, but that has already been signed. And again, my feeling is right now, it's not that I'm for or against what Governor Newsom is doing. He's signing a lot of bills, but he hasn't given the details yet. So we're sort of waiting here going, okay, what is this going to mean to you? A lot of these statutes are going to be codified. So even some of the statutes I in here, have in here are going to change between now and the end of the, between now and the end of the year. Just so you're aware of it, updates tend to take place in not always, like one's going into place in November, I just mentioned. They usually tend to take place in January and July. Those are the every six months. That being said, changes in law took place last March and April. Some are taking place in November, so he may change that. And if you look at the New Parent Leave Act, it's a, uh, parents of employers with five or more employees have to provide, have to allow for at least four months of disability time off. So take a look at that. That is in the middle of your things. And uh, let's see, moving along. Yes. Um, there's a very scary bill going through LA City um, that will require, that may require employers to make up the difference to 100% for 18 weeks. And um, first of all, I don't think it's fair. No, it isn't. And it's, it's not fair to the other employees who would come out of their vacation, their wages. Right. And some employers, they're just so small that this would actually put them out of business. No, I agree. So what can they do now um, be, uh, to um, try and fight this? Because it, it's um, got approved once, but there's groups like the family coalitions that's going to all the council and right. trying to get them pass this and what's your suggestion? I mean, I think that's probably, that I, I am aware of it, I, I think that's probably going to go to litigation because they've had cities and counties, for example, LA County and different counties for minimum wage, you know, different cities, you know, pay very close attention to each city because minimum wage is different. I think that is probably going to go to litigation. I mean, you, you can do a petition, you can show up at the hearing, but the reality is the decision makers probably won't be swayed by that. I don't mean to be negative, but I think that's probably going to go, it, probably it's what's going to happen is it, either the government's going to pick it up because it's too extensive and it's too damaging to an employee. And it's only for those with having um, children. It's nothing to do with caregivers. 
And it's and then like the poor person, like say if I got a heart attack or something. Right. It doesn't do anything to make me a hundred percent, but right. because people make life choices and don't want to accept responsibility. Right. I, I think it's probably gender, probably a reverse gender discrimination too, because you're excluding a specific class and saying, you know, you can do this and you, you can do this for this period of time, and they already have paid leave for that. I don't think it's constitutional to do that, frankly. No, that's a long time. Unfortunately, I get some calls from people saying, hey, I'm going to have a baby, and hey, can I stretch this out so I don't have to go to work for two years? I'm like, no, probably not. You know, it's, you know, unfortunately, no, it's, it's a scary bill. Uh, speaking on that note, and it's a different, it's a good question, though. It's, do you have a follow-up question? No. Okay. Uh, speaking, when you check in each city, when you have the minimum wage compliance, you do have required to have posters. Just, just a side note. No, a lot of cities, even within L.A. County, have different minimum wage requirements. So you need to check carefully on each city. They're expected to be raised every year. The minimum California minimum wage is supposed to go up every year until 2023, according to the new laws into effect. That could change, but I, I think they are going to continue to raise. I get a lot of calls from business owners who do business out, do business in California and they need a California attorney. They're like, wow, would you guys pay each other? Make sure that you're not only in compliance with state law on that, but you're in compliance with whatever city, like Venice, for example, has a different amount, Berkeley. You know, a lot of these other places have a different amount of minimum wage. Make sure you're in compliance with that. Say, well, I applied by state law. I'm like, you didn't apply by the city law. So um, is anybody, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the, I'm gonna jump ahead here. When you're keeping your records, Make, make sure that you're keeping your employee records. There's a section in your booklet here. Make sure you keep all of your employee files for at least four years. If you do not, the reason is that is usually the longest a statute of limitations is. I recommend usually five or six, but at least four years. There's a business and professions code. I've included a copy in that. So you'll say, well, the statute of limitations ran through them to file a wage and cl hour claim. They could still find a plaintiff's attorney who's going to sue you for business and professions code 17200, which is unfair business practices. So what a creative attor plaintiff's attorney is going to allege is that, well, you're, you have a pattern in practice here, and that's how you conduct business. You just underpay everybody. So four years is at least that amount of time. Please note any medical information, there's a note here, you have to keep it separate out of their personnel file. So you may have to have two separate files, however you do that. They need to be separated out. And I would really recommend that you have forms for employee discipline, like we had talked about and you had mentioned. You know, it, and discipline does not necessarily mean, okay, you may be fired. It means I had a conversation with you. You need to have these in their forms taking notes, have them signed, make sure there's someone there to verify it. If you're the owner of the company and an HR person should be instructed to come to you, so say for example, the person says, hey, my, my husband and I are moving to New York and I've really enjoyed working with you, it's just not feasible for me to work here anymore. You don't want to be doing tracking down your HR person, so the owner or someone who has a strong likelihood of being there should be following up with this. And it's, you should have a system in place about how employee complaints are handled, how these are all handled. There's a system in place, okay, this person filed a complaint, or this person was spoken to about their conduct, this person's not taking their breaks, this person's on their cell phone, this person's, you know, takes a half hour, it's supposed to take a half hour lunch and they're coming back an hour late. You need to have some system in place. Uh, you should also have s some systems in place about how sexual harassment complaints and bullying complaints are handled. Usually what I recommend is there's a form that you've received a copy of the policy. You should all have a written policy about this, even if it's just a general one saying we're we don't encourage this kind of behavior, we want you to report to it. If it is a company, you should have at least two, uh, two alternate people that they can report to and some policy upon witnesses and anti-bullying. Uh, ha handling employee absences or, again, excessive breaks things like that, you need to have a policy in place and how this is going to be handled. This is the third time this has happened, okay? Third time, it's first couple times, all right, you know, not good judgment, all right. Third time, you need to come to my office and we need to talk about this so this doesn't become a problem. And you need to be clear to them. Most people will respect boundaries. I mean, there's a few who are not going to. There's a few who's like, oh, I don't get away with this and why don't I get to do that and that's kind of a bummer and, you know, they're going to be upset about it. On and all in all, you're, you're better off enforcing it. I mean, most people will respond to, yeah, my boss is just not gonna let me do that, and I can't. And you know, most people who are reasonable and responsible are going to do that. There is a section in your book, the no match letters are back. I don't know if anybody knows what those are. Those are when your employee's social security numbers do not match 
their social security numbers that they gave you. And so there is a procedure in place that you need to follow. I've had some summaries in here, but I, I think it's important touching upon it. President Obama had suspended that practice with President Trump. That is back as of March of this year. If you receive a no match letter, you need to take it seriously because it means your report, when you're reporting to the IRS and the government, they're not showing that that person has the same social security number. First thing you need to do, just to be clear, if their social security numbers do not match, it is not a basis to fire a person. So you can't solve the problem just saying you're out of here, get out, I don't know what your social security. You need to go to the employee, give them a document that this is absolutely one you should document. And I wanna be clear, with these type of things, you need to take them very seriously because if you don't do it, what's going to happen is the federal government can say, if you didn't do anything, we're gonna charge you with constructive knowledge that you had someone who's not who they say they are, whose social securities and numbers aren't matching. It's not something you wanna do. You wanna just follow this properly. You have to give them a reasonable period of time. My personal opinion is two weeks. You should be able to prove who you are. I mean, I'd probably be so anxious, I'd want him to come in right now and show me, but you, you have to give them a reasonable period of time to do this. You need to follow up with them without pestering them, but they better have a real good reason for not matching their social security numbers with their ID. And if they don't, the next thing you need to do is you need to call an immigration lawyer about how this is going to be, not an employment lawyer, an immigration lawyer about what you can reasonably do and how you're gonna handle this. You know, there is some case law in here where undocumented workers are trying to start suing. If that doesn't happen, you do have grounds to terminate the employee if they're not gonna comply. But you need to be very careful about how this is handled. There is a summary in your book, but again, please take this seriously because I think a lot of employees, employers don't even know that this is back. And again, you will know when you get a letter from the federal government. So again, take it seriously. If you have concerns about whether it's fake or you think someone's trying to get social, call your lawyer, but do take this seriously because, yes. I just have a question. So let's just say you gave them the two weeks. They were unable to prove the information that you needed from them. Right. Do you have to pay them for those two weeks? Yeah, you do have to pay them. I would continue to pay them. I wouldn't not pay them because it could step into another problem. I would call your immigration. Frankly, if I had an employee, employer that was doing that and didn't match their social security numbers, I would give them a week to prove it up and I'd probably be calling immigration counsel then. But yes, you should absolutely pay them for all hours there, all time they're there, because what's gonna happen is, you know, and again, I, the law in this is always changing, but you know they're going to find some plaintiff's attorney who's going to file a complaint against you. And one, you don't want the publicity, frankly. You don't want the nightmare of them threatening to you. Some of these people will get desperate. They'll report you to the feds. You know, let's say you're doing this. And so what you want to do is make sure that they don't try to dink you for illegal practices. So the better practice is always to pay the person. I mean, it's not. I'm not saying it's fair. I'm not. But I mean, I think the better it'll save you a lot of time and money and frankly mental anguish than having to go through litigation or having another issue with the feds and the, what you don't want is the feds yes but wouldn't they still be working during that two week grace period yeah i mean you're still would. getting value for your money right exactly assuming assuming they're still working so what you can't do is say hey your social security cards your credit numbers don't match i want you i'm suspending you without pay i want you to leave now you can't so you can't retaliate because there may be a good reason i don't know what it would be but it's, you know, or someone just wasn't paying attention. Or, it, you know, I mean, there are situations where someone transposes the number when they write it down. I mean, people do make mistakes. Usually it's unusual that the employee and the employer wouldn't catch that. But you do have to pay them. Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm an immigration lawyer. Hi. And we routinely advise clients 60 to 90 days mm -hmm. as a reasonable period of time to cure, to remedy the situation. No, I, know, I, think, I think that's a good, that's a good, that's certainly fair. I give them 30, but that's just I my think the employers be very aggressive, say 30 days, that's it. Yeah. But from our perspective, 60 to 90 days should be. Yeah. Should Again, be good. call your immigration lawyer. Right there. Yeah. Call your, that's why I say call your immigration lawyer. I mean, frankly, for me, I'd want him out immediately, but I do, I do understand what and you're saying. And we're seeing the trend now. So I've, from IRS, they're, you know, providing notice to ICE now. So yeah, that's no, the current I know. trend that we're seeing. Yeah. Because in the past, they really don't. Now they're forwarding information to ICE. Yeah. No, I know they are. And I'm sure you advise, advise a lot of businesses that they will be charged with constructive notice, yes. which is where this comes in. So again, call your immigration lawyer if this happens. <laughs> what happens when they're a citizen? It's not, it's not immigration. Why, I mean, somebody is faking a number somewhere. Right. Uh, but it's not immigration. Right. Then, then you get into my 
area, I guess that would be. If, if it's not an immigration issue, then it's he, he may have a false identity. It could be the idea identity theft. The person, I mean, I, I have a case right now, sad, it, really nice, frankly, very popular singer, as you may have heard, and got involved with a grifter where the person was, had several different identities. And, you know, there are people who run these scams and, you know, identity theft, it, that's nothing new. And you have these people. Then you get into a business toward area where you need to be contacting the district attorney you know, to see who this person really is. and But you need to ascertain what the problem is. You know, if your immigration attorney says, don't help me, you call, you know, me or someone like me who is a business torts lawyer and says, look, you need to figure out how to handle this, not only criminally, but civilly. Because the chances are, you know, well, you know how these people steal. Did it also you have... happens in divorce. Yeah, no, I... <laughs> yeah. It does, but I, I've had a lot of those where people are like, I had no idea who this person was. So the, um, but that's the... And again, he's the expert here on how to handle those situations. But I think it's um, you need to be aware of what that what what can happen if you don't do that. Uh, new change in the law here because I know that I have I know I'm answering questions to go, but I need to do a Q and A too. So sexual harassment training the law has changed here. It used to be 25 or more employees. It has now changed to five or more employees. All have to have at least for non-supervisory employees that. Uh, is at least one hour of sexual harassment training, anti-sexual harassment, which should include a component of anti-bullying training every two years. It was, they were supposed to, everybody's supposed to be in compliance and supervisory employees is every two years. The deadline was this January, this is Governor Newsom did extend it out because a lot of people did not know about this to January 1st of 2021. This applies to temporary hires and seasonal employees. So, so exam a classic example would be Target on the holidays, Santa's workshop, they're hiring a bunch of extra people there and they're gonna be working there for a month and a half, you know, doing the elves and everything. These people all need to be trained. I included some things that you can do, including the, gov the government code and some summaries for you. But it need you need to be trained in all of these. The government code does say effective training. And I know I had a conversation with a few of you before. If you do not go in, you know, is an online video effective? I'm, as a lawyer, I can tell you that there are lawyers who will just sit there and they'll turn on the video and the online self-study and they have no interest at all in learning anything, but they want to get their credits because we have to do 25 every three years and they don't learn a thing. Or they come in, it's like coming into a movie, it's coming into a TV show and saying, oh, I saw the beginning and the end. Okay, you know, I, I have no idea what really went on here. So if you get sued, uh, the DFEH, Department of Fair Housing and Employment, does take complaints for failure to have you know, effective training. And that's the key word there. So you have to think about this. Is it, do you want just a video? Do you want pay, people paying attention? There are HR companies, lawyers, things that can train you. What I've been doing to keep costs down for a lot, and I know a lot of companies are doing, they'll have a combined group come and they have a couple of sessions. But you need to do this. There are no exceptions to it. So I have some people who say, well, I have independent contractors. They need to be trained too. So you know, a lot of these people, places, I'm not saying a video is better than other. I, I personally, I think interactive so they can answer questions is better. But they also have these, you know, HR companies and things like that where it's like 50 bucks a person and they give a discount of a number of people. At a minimum, you should be doing that. Make sure you have the compliance and what you also need. I know it, it's costing you all money and everybody else, you should have a compliance sign or something that says that you were in compliance each year. And again, when you have new, new hires, you need to do this. Temporary and seasonal employees, it's usually the first 30 days or the first 100 hours worked, whichever comes first. So some people say, look, you have six months to a year to train them. I would really recommend in the first two weeks that you have a new employee say, look, this is just part of your training. You're either gonna have to watch the video or do something or if there happens to be one every two years with your training or however you want to handle that. But you need to have a system in place. Uh, they will not forgive you if you don't do this. You, you can result in fines. If you ever got sued for sexual harassment, they'll say, oh, well, they don't even do sexual harassment training. That, that is going to be, it is not prima facie evidence that makes their case, but the person's going to go, oh, you're not taking this seriously at all. And all that has to have happened is you have a few people on the jury who have been harassed or if they've been bullied or they know someone who has. And I can guarantee you, as a trial lawyer, every single person on that jury has either known someone, bullied the person, harassed them, or known someone who has or has witnessed it. 
I can guarantee you that that happens in schools all the time is just a starter. So I can guarantee you by the time they graduate high school, they have experienced this and all this has happened is they empathize with this and say, yeah, I didn't like, it's not even going to be about you. It's going to be about, yeah, I didn't like that bully, that guy I didn't know, or that, that girl I know, she always was doing something and that's going to be it because the people have preconceptions and biases and they're going to be more than happy to render a verdict against you. So again, if you have a system in place with doing this, there are a lot of companies going to do this. There are lawyers, there are HR persons. I really would recommend interactive. You know, some of these people again will combine costs because you're like, oh my God, I don't want to pay, you know, what a lawyer would charge or what a company is going to charge. It's like, oh great, this is another, I mean, I don't know how much it helps that it's tax deductible, but again, you need to be doing that. The law is going to change again. There is going, to, there's different kinds of training. There is also, if you're, for those of you who are interested, because I think it's uh, any decent human being would do it anyways, uh, is to have some knowledge of it. There are more in-depth trainings. They have like four hours of training and it includes empathy, people who go through traumatic situations. Personally, I think any in company with 50 employees or more should be doing that because they have to manage so many people. And again, I, I hear this a lot where people make off-color comments that are not appropriate and they may think it's funny, but another person takes offense. For example, we had a client who called the other day and they were in a meeting and they were concerned about harassment part. And one of the attorneys, one, it was an attorney actually in a law firm who called me and said one of the attorneys was, in was evaluating one of, the, one of the witnesses saying, hey, she's really hot. And some of the ladies in the in thing took offense. It, that's the kind of thing that's gonna get you sued. It really is um, evaluating a person based on their looks, their physique, anything like that. You know, it, men or women ha really has no place in the workplace. I mean, as a lawyer, I can tell you the only thing that is relevant if there's a jealousy problem or one's more attractive than the other could be viewed that way. But again, anything other than that. So I hear this a lot, or employers are calling saying people are making really tasteless comments. It could, it's not. It's not if you hurt someone's feelings all the time, but you need to be sensitive to what the issues can be. And I think that everybody can benefit from this and just sort of learning to be better people. And again, it's not ever going to hurt a person to be civil to your colleagues, whether you want to hang out with them after work, treat them with respect and dignity. I mean, I think that's probably the best course of action, but a lot of these are in more detail. And what you don't want to have happen is a lot of you have heard maybe about the Jones Day lawsuit. This is the big law firm where they have a bunch of women who have come forward and saying, look, their culture there is, is so abhorrent to us. I mean, they had ones where they were asking some of the female associates to be in bikini contests at pool parties, at firm meetings. They had a couple of them where they were razzing her. Now they're going to, you know, there's, this is all over the news. This is the one people are watching. There's the confidentiality aspect of it. They also have another suit going against him where the father decided to stay home, who was an attorney there. I don't know how he worked that out with his wife. So he decided to take the maternity leave and, you know, to take that time, that family leave, time off. He got harassed at work and it was a gender discrimination case because they were harassing him and saying, you'll be a man and why do you have to do it? Can't your wife do it? That's also illegal. So you have a lot of suits like these coming forward. That's probably going to evolve into it. Frankly, I think it should. I don't, but there are a lot of companies. I get a lot of people who come to me and say, look, I, I'm not agreeing with this, but you know, I have a mortgage, I have kids, I have, biz, I have bills to pay. I don't, want, I don't want to be red flagged. I don't want to be the problem employee. Two, where would I get another job? And three, you have the Me Too movement. Some of you are keeping up with this. I have to because I'm involved with it. And I think it's very important. Some of them you have, like, companies are just not hiring women now. They're like, okay, if I have to choose the woman or the man, you know, personally, that's a stupid way to handle it because it's also discrimination in hiring. But um, a lot of people are saying, I'm just going to solve the problem. I'm just not going to hire any women. You know, that's, people, people get concerned about that. Say, they say, what did you have your last job? I got sexually harassed at my last job. I gave notice. Did you sue him? You know, people have valid concerns about that because they say, well, is that going to be a fact? You know, some people are very empathetic and say, it's all right. But other people you know, they have legitimate concerns to go, well, am I not going to get hired at my next job because I, you know, sued or filed a complaint against my employer? So there, there's a lot of fear of, I feel a lot of fear of reprisal, economic concerns, and just what is this going to do to my career? I mean, I'm following with avid interest the Harvey Weinstein and Ashley Judd situation to see how that works out because I think it's going to set a precedent and I hope it does. That being said, you need to train these people. And, you know, frankly, I'm not trying to say that some of the people believe this or not. Some people really, frankly, are just not brought up that way. They're never educated that way. I'm not saying they should probably figure it out by a certain age. But having some education and opening their minds to some of this, say, look, 
whether you agree or not, this is, you know, there's the hard line, which you always have to take. It's like, whether you agree with it or not, you're, you're going to do this if you want to work here. If you don't want to work here, fine. This, just tell me now because you will be out of here. And that's the policy I have in my office. But it's uh, anybody else who does it. Some people, honestly, just get brought up in different situations, may not be aware. I'm not saying it's particularly sensitive or a good idea in this day and age. It's Oh, it never ceases to amaze me. It's like, how can you not know this? But, you know, I mean, you may be giving people the opportunity to learn skills that they can carry with them for the rest of their life. So moving along quickly, I just want to talk about the employee handbook. We touched upon it here. It's towards the end of your book. Independent contractors, very important. If you look at the... Um, if you look at the summaries here, there's the ABC test, but pretty much what from the guy, it, here's, but here's what it says. The AB5 bill the, summarizes the Dynamex case. They have a summary in it. This is close to the end of, it's close to the end of your pamphlet here. And again, we're running short on time. I'd be happy to answer questions afterwards. The Dynamex case pretty much says that an individual can be considered an employee instead of an independent contractor unless the hiring entity can prove the following, and the burden will be on the employee. The person is free from the control and direction of the hiring entity in connection with the performance of the work, both under the con contract for performance and of the work and in fact. Okay, so if you're sitting at your desk all day, or you're, well, a lot of people say, hey, look, you're free to work from home if you want, but you need to be available from nine to five. And if I call you, I expect you to pick up and you're doing these things. They may, their employees working remotely. If you're doing, a big part of it is the control the employer has over them. If you need to be available to answer phone calls all day, you're, you're probably, an, unless you're working on a particular project, you're probably an employee. So the person performs work that is outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business. So if the hiring entity, for example, handles real estate and they're handling all these independent contractors, you may have a problem there. Some of the industries, industries are uh, the adult film industry, uh, janitorial staffs, Uber is the classic one. We've all heard about this and the Uber and the Lyft drivers. Those are examples. People who work in restaurants, sometimes they just hire them. If they, are, they need to perform a service that is not usually performed at their office, otherwise they're going to be considered that. And the person is customarily engaged in an independently established trade, occupation, or business of the same nature as that is involved in the work performed. So say, for example, you have an employee, you bring them in, they say, no, I've never really done that before, but I'm going to work here. You're hired for a specific job. It, it makes it much less likely that you're going to do this. If you don't comply with these, and the, you're always better off. The classic example I see with a lot of people is they contract out their, janit their cleaning staff. The, you know, the people come through here and <clears throat> make sure the windows are clean and everything looks nice, and they're all independent contractors. Then you're going to have a violation problem. If you're one, they're independent contractors. You're either going to have, and you have to make sure that the company that you're contracting with is doing that too. Because I have had cases where it gets complicated. They say, well, I, I didn't hire these people. I contracted the company. I'm like, yeah, but you contracted the company who did this. These people are going to look for the deep pockets. Highly light, unlikely they're going to sue an individual. They're going to assume that a company has more money, and that's what they're going to go at. If they can get you involved in this, they will. And I'm seeing a lot more of that these days with people suing other people. So you need to be aware of it. And again, there is a, a test from a Supreme Court decision. It was actually in 1989. It's called Borello. There are other, it's codified in Labor Code 2750.3. And that is also A and B. So if you take a look at that, that's also there. But this, again, this is all going into effect in January 1st, 2020. I don't know what the independent contractor legislation is going to work. I, I would be, I, I can't imagine a situation where Uber doesn't sue or try to exert some sort of legislative pressure. So they're going to do that. It's just costing them too much money. Personally, I also think that if Uber doesn't step in, someone else will. But for anybody who's been in Uber, you, you would, know, would know that. What to include in an employee handbook, I think we're running short on time. So I have a summary. It's towards the end of the book if you'd like to review that. And just uh, I would look at the main thing I want to make sure is that you have EEO sale policies, sick leave, and family policies, and you're including any additional information, contacts, person, who's responsible for what. And again, be in, note, note that these are not exhaustive lists. But you need to stay current with the law. There are a lot of services for free, literally. We'll send you, they want your business or have some way of keeping track of it at least twice a year. Quarterly is a good idea because there's usually a time for compliance, but if you don't do it, towards the end of this pamphlet, there's some preventative measures. I sort of interweaved it throughout that employers can take. 
And again, have, have postings in a break room. Have a break room or some area. All of them should be current. Again, paid family leave, sex, anti-sexual harassment, wage an hour, minimum wage, sick leave, things like that. And note that they have a clear procedure and record keeping policy in your office. It, the more organized you are, the better. Again, make sure all your employee files are kept in a secure location. It's a, have a clear company policy about paydays, sick days, vacation days, and other benefits offered to employees. And again, vacation pay, for example, it's not user to lose it. You need to pay them. So if you do not pay them, that is going to be a wage and hour violation. So for example, the policies I usually recommend are towards the, at the end of the year, any sick, you know, some people say, look, if you don't use your, your vacation time, you waive it. They don't. They need to be paid for it. And you need to attribute to that. Because what's going to happen is if they leave, they're going to say, well, you owe me money. All of your wage statements are, out, are not in compliance. And you're going to have all these penalties, and I think you have a wage, you know, you have a business and professions code problem and a PAGA claim because I think you're doing it to everybody. So you do need to pay them for that. Make sure you have someone who's competent to handle your payroll and things like that. If they need to be trained, send them to the seminar, whatever they need to do, and make sure that someone is overseeing them. I have seen situations where they go, look, I thought such and such was doing a good job. They always reported to me, and then they find out later they're not up to date, you know, they're not doing these things, so you need to do that. Have a procedure in place for exempt meal breaks and sick days and things like that. Make sure your employees are paid on time, without exception. And if you'd like to read the rest of it, and again, make sure each new hire shows proper ID and that you can validate it. Four years for the records. Employment agreements are recommended. Do consult with an attorney before you do that to make sure you don't miss anything. And you have a clear written sexual harassment policy. And you should also review your insurance policy, your insurance options. I don't know if any of you are familiar with employer, employer practices liability insurance. That will not help you with uh, any kind of wage and hour claim. But if you have a harassment claim or things like that, I have had attorneys with a lot of or clients with a lot of success and coverage for that. So you may want to look at that. And again, if you have some people in the office who are mouthy or a larger company, like there are a lot of the bigger companies and bigger firms pay a lot of money for it. But it used to be too far out of reach for smaller businesses or medium-sized businesses. It was just too expensive. But now that's changed, so they have, re I mean, again, it's not going to be free but or cheap. But again, it, you have it without saying, I'm paying an arm and a leg for it. And it's a legitimate business expense. So EPL, it's also referred to as EPLI insurance. So if you have an environment where a lot of people are working together, it might be worthwhile because what you don't want to have happen is one who's, you know, California's lawsuit city, as we know, or you don't want to have the, the person who files a false claim and thinks that everybody's harassing him or her, or someone who has a legitimate claim and there's someone in the office who either hid it or you had no idea about. Because I can guarantee you if a person's harassing another person, the last thing they're going to do is go to the owner or someone who's in supervisory position say, I plan on bullying and harassing everybody here and you know I'm gonna make it you know I'm gonna expo give you a lot of exposure here. So that is something to consider. And again, I know I flew through a couple of these and I wish I had more time to talk to you about all of these. I am happy to answer any questions afterwards. We have a digital copy. I appreciate all of you coming in, your avid interest, I really do. I mean not just because it's legal, but I think it's important to have a healthy workplace, but also a place where employers can be profitable and prosperous without having to worry about retribution from any kind of claim. I get a lot of calls from employers who are saying, I don't know what to do because all these laws are changing. And you know, the, the classic one I hear is, I really tried to be nice to this person. I tried to be flexible. I didn't want to bother them. So again, it's unfortunately, if you are the employer, you, you need to have some supervisory plan in question. But it also, work should be a nice place to work. You should enjoy going into work and enjoy your work. And I don't enjoy my work every day, particularly when I've worked 15 hours, 16 hours. But I, having these in place, I think it will give you a sense of well-being. Like, I'm covered, I'm good, and I, and I can proceed forward and actually get to the business of what I'm, whatever business yours is, instead of worrying about another claim. And if there's a problem, you have your paperwork ready. So thank you all of you for your time. I really appreciate it. And yeah.